I didn't understand what they were trying to do because they weren't executing it well enough. But I can see now that a great many of them were attempting to mimic William Gibson. I've been trying to collect my thoughts uh, for this review for the last few days, and uh, it's proven difficult, to say the least. And eh, I think mostly I'm just afraid because uh, one, the genre, and two, uh, the books. And I know that both the genre and the books have a, a, a pretty big following, and they also have a lot of hate. So I'm nervous. Finally read Neuromancer, and I also read Count Zero, and I started Mona Lisa Overdrive and DNF'd it. Um, so I'm, I turned 41 uh, at the end of the month. And uh, while I have been aware of Neuromancer for the majority of my reading life, um, I've just always stayed away from it. And it's been a very intentional thing for lots of reasons. And some of those reasons were other people's opinions. And a lot of times as readers, you know, we get hit with a random opinion of a book, maybe from somebody that we trust, maybe not, maybe it really is truly random. And we take the calculus of that opinion and we put it somewhere and we hold on to it as a truth. And it's tough. I mean, this is just a very human thing to do. Uh, I don't know necessarily if Neuromancer is exactly that in my life. Uh, but roundabout, yeah. I understood that it was a book that, that came with some weird baggage. And... In the 90s, when I really had a good opportunity to read it, we were going through a transitional moment with technology. And even as a young person in the world in the 90s, it was very easy to see how quickly things were changing. And I felt then, as I feel now, that, you know, we're living in the future and we're living through this time of great novelty. And I knew enough about what the book was about that I made the conscious choice to avoid it and wait until the technological change that I was witnessing had fully matured into something newer or bigger maybe closer to what Neuromancer is about. And I got to say, this was the right choice for me in that time and across this, this, this span of time. So often when I read science fiction and I read the science fiction that I enjoy reading, it is an interpretation of a possible future. A lot of times as readers, what we have this inkling to do or this, you know, this impulse to do is to pick out the things that didn't achieve the mark. You know, whether you're reading it in 1999 or 2023 and you're reading a book from the 1960s or the 1950s, there's quite a lot that is laughable, especially stuff that's pre-space program, uh, stuff that's purely imaginative in terms of what we might be able to accomplish as humans, what the future might look like. And I have always had this ability to read those books, to read science fiction books in a way in which my acknowledgement of their existence is as if they are a product of an alternate temporal reality, that they are, they are the product of a parallel universe. 
And they aren't necessarily a product of, of our universe. They are, in reality, they are. They're written by people in our timeline and in our universe. But the way that I like to think of them, the way that I think of them in, in a way that makes me not feel like I need to critique the, um, the, the truthiness of, uh, of a future prediction is to just place it in its own reality and let it live in its own reality. Neuromancer is the first science fiction book maybe ever that I have read that I can put my hand on and, and, and say with relative clarity that there are aspects of this book, whether or not the technical truths are accurate, there are aspects of this book that describe our present in a remarkably accurate way. We can't talk about William Gibson or William Gibson's writing without talking about his narrative style. And this was something that I was unaware of. And I, I didn't have uh, the context for his narrative style until reading his books. The, the one thing that I can say, if you're going to sit down and read these books, is get comfortable with confusion. Even if you're an apt reader, if you've got a lot of books under your belt, uh, you're experienced, you, you know, you, you're not necessarily daunted by extreme works of fiction, things like, you know, Ulysses, if, you know, if you can at least approach a book like that and work your way through it methodically, you know, as a reader, you would think, man, I can tackle anybody's narrative style. If I can, get, if I can wrap my head around James Joyce, I can wrap my head around anybody, right? If I can, if I can, uh, if I can pull the layers back of Shakespearean sonnets, uh, then, then anything is accessible. And I think that there is this tendency, especially in writers who are not very good writers, that they fall into a narrative style which is overly descriptive and um, relies on atmospherics and maybe relies on edginess and that sort of thing to prompt the reader into recognizing that, oh, they, this is a good writer. And I think that that's something you see in a lot of creative writing workshops with young writers. Um, you know, they've read what's out there. They have, they have classified uh, various narrative styles that they like or that feel productive to them. And they, try and graft those narrative styles into their own. And it, it's part of the process. And there's, this isn't a complaint. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way writing goes. But having read Neuromancer now, it's giving me a whole new light on uh, papers that I have workshopped by uh, you know, other students in creative writing classes and narrative styles that I have encountered from people in the late 90s and early 2000s and so on, that um, I didn't understand what they were trying to do because they weren't executing it well enough. But I can see now that a great many of them were attempting to mimic William Gibson and his very particular narrative style. One of the things I noticed over and over is that in the midst of fleshing out this very atmospheric world and layering details and bringing the reader as, as far into this atmosphere as you can bring the reader, there are these innate transitions within the prose that somehow get completely lost. And you can go back and, you know, often you have to read a passage over and over and over again and figure out literally where the hell am I? 
what what is happening what is the blocking of this narrative where are the characters how many characters are in the room are we in uh the real world are we in cyberspace are we within a construct and i i believe that gibson did all of that intentionally it was written intentionally to be confusing in some ways and this really gets to the heart of my main criticism of Gibson, which is he is glossing over a thin plot narrative with atmospherics. Is there anything wrong with that? I don't think so. It, it is what it is. It is Neuromancer. It is Count Zero. Um, the narrative style is William Gibson's narrative style. And if you were to go back and read his contemporaries at the time, he stands out for very clear, plausible, excellent reasons. His style is unique in science fiction for the time. The things that he was writing about were unique and had a direct effect on our actual physical reality, uh, both in terms of, you know, the definition of cyberspace, a, a shared, a mutually agreed upon shared hallucination that could not be further or that could not be closer to the truth of our reality. Um, the term Microsoft, the term the matrix, you know, all of these things are coined in the book and popularized within the book and they found their way into our actual real reality and so there is this amazing co-creation that occurred with these works of literature that i don't think can be ignored if we look at both of the books that i completed uh, neuromancer and count zero they're both very similar um, they're both very similar in structure and in style and subject. They're very close to one another. And, uh, you know, of course, they take place in the same universe. Um, and there's even characters that are shared between the books. One of the things that I have heard throughout the years is that Count Zero is a superior book to Neuromancer for reason A, reason B, reason C. I frankly can't distinguish between the two well enough to tell you which one I enjoyed more. They both felt like clones of one another. And, um, and that includes the, the resolution at the end of each book. The plot just sort of, and then diffuses in each book. And some might argue with me on that, but I think if you were to really lay out the actual physical plot of the book, which is hard to wrap your head around as you're reading it, you are literally hunting for the puzzle pieces and putting them in there and saying, oh, this is the plot. I understand where we're going. This is the motivation of whatever. <laughs> and um, by and large, it adds to the confused state that you live in reading these books. And I think that that is the point of the books. And maybe not the point, but that is the experience of these books. And it, it's interesting to me because clearly that state of being, that confused state of being that the reader is in while reading the books is very similar to the constant state of confusion that the people of that universe live in. Where all the lines are, of reality are beginning to blur and smear, where you aren't really sure sometimes if you're in a construct or if you're in actual waking reality and what does it mean to be in these different places as an individual? Um, 
is there a spiritual component to cyberspace? Is, are, are we co-creating the spirituality of, of cyberspace by inflicting our humanness on it? It's, they're great questions and great little kernels to let your mind chew on, but you do it during this constant state of confusion. And I don't necessarily think that it's a bad thing. I think that one of the things that drives a reader forward in a good book is being a little confused, is trying to figure out what's going on and what are we doing. When we run into a narrative that just lays it all out on the plate and spoon feeds it, that can be an enjoyable experience, but you don't necessarily engage with the book in the same way. So is Count Zero better than Neuromancer? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. It, it's a very subjective kind of question. But I'll tell you this. <laughs> I went and I looked at uh, bad reviews. I looked up some bad reviews for Neuromancer. And uh, a lot of what I got was the same sort of thing, which was, um, oddly, the, the book lacks description, which I... I don't know how anybody could make that, uh, that assessment. The books are mostly description. They're mostly atmospheric. The, there is very little action that you can, it's not that it's a, that their books free of action. They're certainly action, but they're not action driven novels. They're atmospheric novels. So the idea that there wouldn't be enough description is silly. Then the other thing that I see is I only got 20 pages in, right? And therefore, the whole book sucks. And I, I get that. I've been there with books before where you get 20 pages in and you throw it across the room and you're like, fuck this book. I don't want this book. Um, and I can absolutely see why someone would have that reaction to Neuromancer. There are a, a lot of people that I know that uh, have a very rigid way of thinking and this book would absolutely drive them up the wall. There's no way that they would get through the first couple of chapters and they might have a low opinion of it at, after that. And, you know, and that'd be fine. But uh, the reality is that the books really are as good as the hype. And there's a lot of hype with these books. And, and a lot of the hype has been this manufactured marketing of the term cyberpunk, which as I understand it, Gibson didn't coin, didn't intend, and has had to make peace with. Um, I don't really give a shit about subgenres. Science fiction is science fiction to me, and uh, subgenres are whatever. Uh, we can get granular about everything, but it's not something I'm going to spend a lot of time losing sleep on. But I really don't think that we can ignore the popular culture effect that this book has had. And, and not just popular culture, but corporate culture. Because these are very much books uh, that are warnings about corporate control. And, you know, uh, in my mind, it's handled very well by Gibson. He's not heavy handed in it and he's not preaching about the nature of corporations or the good or evil of corporations. He's simply painting a very, very descript picture of what a future that is corporate centric looks like and what, what could happen based on the amount of technology that corporations are able to control. And this is, of course, deeply relevant for our present moment and can't be ignored. <laughs> but also, you know, we can't ignore the other bits of co-creation uh, that, have, that have surfaced because of this. We've got in this entire subgenre of cyberpunk that exists now. And in my mind, uh, and I'm not a big reader of, of quote, modern science fiction, modern science fiction being from the 90s onward, but I, I, I have a low opinion, maybe unjustly, of a lot of cyberpunk literature out there. But the source material here, this Neuromancer and Count Zero, are fantastic. And 
even though I am not a, a, a rabid fan of the Matrix films, I enjoyed them. They were a product of their time. Um, I can't disregard the impact that Neuromancer had on those movies. And um, to I can't disregard the extent to which uh, the Wachowskis... Um, stole from it creatively. Uh, although there are great differences. There are magnificent differences that set the books apart from those movies. And you really can't compare the two plot wise. It's they're completely different creatures, but there's a lot of influence. And I think we can, we can all recognize that. Here's a couple of weird things that I, I kind of want to mention. I, so I did some Googling uh, as I was reading these and, you know, looking for Neuromancer art. And I was really shocked at how little there was. Now, if you go and you search cyberpunk art, there's a, just an entire universe of art out there. But in terms of art that has been created specifically related to Neuromancer and Count Zero, there is surprisingly little. And it, it makes me think, and this isn't an accusation, but it makes me think that a lot of younger people today, uh, people who were born post 9-11, have not read these books. And they have based their opinions of the books on things that they have heard from other people, uh, which, again, we're all prone to do. Um, but I think that they have latched on to newer iterations of quote cyberpunk and to them these newer iterations of cyberpunk are more relevant to them uh because they don't forget things like or they don't miss things like cell phones you know we could all we could stand here and wag our fingers all day long at william gibson and say what are you doing with pay phones 150 years in the future but i you know it to me, it was one of the atmospherics that made the book and the world more real and more true. Not the fact that they all had microcomputers in their pockets. Um, the other thing is that searching for uh, deck art, uh, so the, um, the Ono Sendai decks that are present in the books, there's art online uh, for these decks and where people, makers, have uh, cobbled together old Commodore keyboards and some tablets and made Ono Sendai decks. And I think this is the coolest thing ever. Uh, I didn't know they existed until I started Googling them. And in terms of art related to the book, this is the tippy top. It's, it's so good. Go Google them. It, they're just a joy to look at. <laughs> so in terms of, uh, of, of style, I, I wanted to share one more thing before we get too long in the tooth on this review. I, I went to chat GPT, which uh, seemed appropriate in, in this situation. And I asked it uh, two questions. I, I asked it to write a description of going and buying groceries. And then I specified, please write this description of going and buying groceries in the style of William Gibson. And I was not disappointed. <laughs> and if we really want to isolate the things that make William Gibson's style uh, singular to William Gibson, this AI illustration of it, uh, AI <laughs> illustration of it is perfect. Um, so please, Come along with me for just a second. <laughs> let's, let's listen to this. In the depths of the neon-lit metropolis, where the frenetic pulse of the city's digital veins intersected with the tangible, the act of buying groceries had evolved into an art form of urban survival. The gridlock of augmented reality met the clash of corporeal existence at the supermarket sliding glass doors, a threshold to a realm where the lines between the analog and digital, organic and synthetic blurred like transient graffiti on the subway wall. Stepping inside, I was immediately greeted by a symphony of flickering price tags and sensory overloading holograms, each vying for my fleeting attention. 
aisle upon aisle beckoned with kaleidoscopic rays of sustenance as the as if the entire food pyramid had been digitized and spat out onto the shelves packaging a modern day hieroglyph promised exotic tastes of transcendent experiences each product a thicket to an alternate reality i could keep going but you can see how quickly you would lose your footing your narrative footing in 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 a jungle of description like this and i really think that that model nailed it uh, because that's what it's like reading these books that's what it's like and if you push on page after page you're rewarded with amazing atmospherics and amazing descriptions and um it's true it's good the writing style is good uh man, <laughs> it's a lot. And by the time I got to Mona Lisa Overdrive, I think I got to, you know, the fourth chapter and I, I had just said, you know what, I've, I've had enough. I've had enough of the confusion. I've had enough of not, not knowing what characters I'm talking to because there's so many characters. And uh, are we in a hotel room? Or did we go outside? We're describing a, an outdoor place now. Or, oh, no, we're in a construct. It, it, I'd had enough. I'd had enough. And I put it down. And I said, maybe I'll revisit this later. But I'm done. I've done my part. <laughs> so there you go. That's your review. <laughs> Thanks. In the depths of the neon-lit metropolis, where the frenetic pulse of the city's digital veins intersected with the tangible, the act of buying groceries had evolved into an art form of urban survival. The gridlock of augmented reality met the clash of corporeal existence at the supermarket sliding glass doors, a threshold to a realm where the lines between analog and digital, organic and synthetic, blurred like transient graffiti on a subway wall. Stepping inside, I was immediately greeted by a symphony of flickering price tags and sensory overloading holograms, each vying for my fleeting attention. Isle upon aisle beckoned with kaleidoscopic arrays of sustenance, as if the entire food pyramid had been digitized and spat out onto the shelves. Packaging, a modern-day hieroglyph, promised exotic tastes and transcendent experiences, each product a ticket to an alternate reality. Amidst this sensory cacophony, I navigated through the throngs of fellow consumers, each clad in their augmented reality-enhanced attire, faces obscured by visors and masks. They scan, swipe, and gesture, guided by unseen algorithms that curated their choices. The checkout lanes, staffed by automatons who spoke in soothing, synthesized voices, accepted nothing as quaint as cash. Instead, encrypted transactions flowed through the ether, leaving no trace for prying eyes. Grocery lists, once scribbled on scraps of paper, had been supplanted by neural implants and augmented memories. The echoes of whispered conversations between our internal AI companions and the store's AI overlords filled the air, as they bartered on our behalf, optimizing each selection for maximum efficiency and sensory gratification. And yet, amidst the cold hum of technological progress, moments of analog nostalgia seeped through, the feel of an apple skin, the scent of freshly baked bread, and the simple joy of human interaction at the deli counter served as reminders of the flesh and blood existence that still clung tenaciously to our digitalized lives. Exiting the store, I carried my groceries in reusable, biodegradable bags, and not to the enduring need to preserve what was left of our fragile world. The streets teemed with a cacophony of voices, all connected yet disconnected, each individual ensnared in their own digital cocoon. Buying groceries in this city of cybernetic dreams and dystopian realities was a dance between the old and the new, a testament to our ability to adapt, survive, and perhaps, even find moments of genuine connection amid the relentless march of progress. In the heart of this neon tinged labyrinth, the act of buying groceries remained a microcosm of the human experience. An eternal quest for sustenance and meaning in a world where lines continue to blur and boundaries to shift.